the scripture I'm going to read, most of you can quote, and we have read this many, many, many times from Proverbs, the third chapter, it's verse 5 and verse 6, and as I say, this is something that most of us have memorized. There are certain scriptures that seem to come up over and over again. You certainly remember Matthew 6, the Lord's Prayer. You remember John 3.16, for God so loved the world. You remember Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. There are scriptures like this. This is one of them. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. And Lord, we thank you for your presence here. We thank you that you are with us. In everything, we need to trust you. We pray that you will speak to us, and open our hearts to receive your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Please be seated. Many of us have had the happy privilege of holding a newborn baby in our arms, marveling at the beauty and wonder of life. And at times like that, all is well with the world. We just thank God for the wonderful gift that he has given us of a new baby that has come into this incredible world that God has given us to enjoy. And as our, our children, our grandchildren, our nieces, our nephews grow, we, we really understand that it's important for us to teach them some very important lessons. One of the most important lessons they can ever learn is this, despite Whatever challenges may come your way in life, put your trust in God. If you are elevated to the heights of human achievement and your name is on every tongue, put your trust in God. And if disaster strikes and disease has racked your body and uh, natural disasters, whatever comes your way and you are just in the worst possible situation. Put your trust in God. If you become the next Bitcom billionaire, <laughs> I don't know how many of those are here today, but you now have money that you could buy anything your heart desires. You put your trust in God. This is a very simple concept, but very profound. We really have got to put our trust in God together as a body of Christ, we can say, in God, we trust. We know that if you happen to have a US dollar in your wallet or in your purse, you'll see that printed on it, in God, we trust. That is what I want to remind us of, talk to us about today, our trust in God. Trusting God should be a very natural thing for us to do, especially as we think of how natural it is for a child to trust their parent. When they wake up, they see mom and dad. When they go to sleep, when they go through their day, this constant presence is there. Of course, mothers in particular more so even than, than fathers. But, but every, every child uh, can be awakened. There might be a loud noise, some commotion, going on, the child will, will uh, come awake and, and look around, okay, there's mom, there's dad, and all is well, they go back to sleep. Or it could be a perfectly calm situation, nothing going on, everything is peaceful, but the child awakes and they don't see mom or dad. And so in perfect baby language, they, they, they start to uh, yell, mom, dad, where are you? Get back here, now. You know, you're, uh, I'm sure your children did that as, as mine did. And when you come running uh, at their command, they say, now you just stay right here and don't, don't move. And then they fall back asleep. This is how, how children uh, 
interact and understand this, this thing of trust. As long as my mom or dad is there, all is well. And so we start to learn a lesson from this, that trust isn't dependent upon our situation, whether times are bad or times are good. Our trust is secure in the person who we have our trust in. As long as that, that person is there, we are okay. We trust uh, that all is well. And of course, uh, yeah, I, I remember one day my dear daughter was sick. She was you know, very young. And so I got a call. I went, got her from home and took her to see the doctor. And there were some things that he needed to do in checking her condition, but she was just not having anything to do with it. So he said, Dad, um, can you please hold her? And, and while you're holding her, I'll, I'll do my examination. And so, of course, as soon as I picked her up again, all was well. She was totally at peace, and he was prodding and poking and uh, doing all he needed to do. And then the last thing, he got the, the little spatula, you know, depressed her tongue to see what was going on. That was a little more than she could handle, so she just sort of reared back and threw up all over me. And, and uh, of course, I was wearing a, a sparkling, um, clean white shirt, my favorite silk tie. And, um, and so what did I do? I just held her. She's my child. She trusts me. She's not well, but she doesn't want to be anywhere else. She doesn't want this doctor messing with her. As long as dad is there, that's fine. So I took her home, washed her up, and uh, put her in her crib. She was perfectly fine, her trust totally intact. And I was feeling fabulous that I was a father, that I had a daughter who trusted me. And, uh, well, uh, the tie didn't, didn't survive, but, you know, I, I washed the shirt. <laughs> trust. This is one of the most beautiful things we experience in our human relationships. And, and truly, I've never seen a baby who figures they have to, to do something special uh, to, to be able to put their trust in their parent. They just figure this is the way it is. Uh, this is the one I saw when I was born. Uh, my mom's here, my dad's here, and there's just something in them that seems to teach them immediately, these are the people I will trust, and unless or until a parent destroys that trust or in some way communicates to that child, you can't trust me, you will trust your parents until they die or you die or somebody dies. That's just the way it is. Many of us have been in our 40s, 50s, 60s when our parents die, but until that day we trust everything they say, we trust what they tell us to do, it is just a beautiful thing. So let's, let's take it up a notch. Um, give me an A flat or, or a G or some, somewhere around there. I, I don't know how many of you uh, are old enough to know this. I'm waiting to hear. I trust in God wherever I may be. Anybody know that? Upon the land or on the rolling sea Though billows roll He keeps my soul My heavenly Father watches over Why are Asher and Shamora singing? This is a man. You're, you're that old? I trust in God I know he cares for me on mountain bleak or on the stormy sea. Though billows roll, let me hear those billows rolling there. He keeps my soul, my heavenly Father, why? 
watches over me. We'll sing that chorus again so we can hear the billows roll. I trust in God. Sing it. I know He cares for me. On mountain bleak or on the stormy sea. He keeps my soul, my heavenly Father watches over me. Amen, amen, amen. That's the truth of our situation. We ought to place our complete faith and trust in God. That should be our default position. It doesn't matter who we are, where we are, what we've done, what's going on. Our trust has to be in God so that together we can say, in God, we trust. Now that doesn't mean we'll always understand God's ways. We won't always agree with his ways, with his methods. We, we know that he orders our steps according to his will, his plan, his purpose. And he doesn't even feel that he needs to ask our permission for the things that he does and the way he leads our lives. But with all that is going on, he is our father and we trust him. I trust in God. I know he cares for me. Amen. Amen. Yes, give a hand to our God. I trust him. Now, sometimes you are in a position like mine where you are charged with bringing the word of God to the people of God. And sometimes as you're going through, God just puts something in your heart, in your mind. You're not planning for it, but it's just something that he says, no, you need to communicate this. And uh, about a month ago, I was reading a particular article in the Christianity Today magazine, October 2017 edition, an article by a lady by the name of Rachel Gilson. And it described her conversion to Christianity as a woman who was dealing with a same gender sexual attraction. And you may say, oh, man, why do you want to talk about something like this two weeks before Easter? You know, we're just thinking about food and fun. Christmas, yeah, well, time goes fast, man. <laughs> Christmas is already history. Uh, Easter's next. And, and, you know, why do you bring up something like this uh, at a time like this? But I, all I can tell you is that... Um, when God puts something on your heart, you really need to go with it and, and do what he says because, again, he doesn't ask me uh, what I think would be good to preach. He tells me. And, and so I don't know who is here today. I don't know what situations are happening, but I, I do need to address this issue that is constantly before us and uh, something that we cannot ignore. So Stats Canada in the last survey reports that 1.7% uh, of the Canadian population identifies themselves as homosexual. But in the name of diversity and inclusion, I mean, every politician, every media outlet, every uh, uh, school is, is just teaching not only that we, we accept uh, the sexual diversity uh, that, that we see in society, but that everything's permissible, everything should be encouraged and in fact celebrated. And, and so our children and young people come home from school and uh, come to their Sunday school classes with a lot of questions, uh, asking how they should respond to what they are hearing and what they are learning. Many of your 
colleagues at work are part of, of the LGBTQ community and, and they are people you are working with every day. And certainly, I also need to address some in our own congregation who are having uh, issues and struggles with same-sex attraction and some of the sexual variants that are present in our world today. Uh, most of us are very aware of, of what Scripture has to say, and I, I'm, I'm going to uh, just state this again and then give you uh, a, a little bit of an idea of how we need to handle the Word of God. God established in Scripture one plan for physical intimacy, sexual intimacy, uh, in, in His Word. That's between a man and a woman who are joined in the covenant of marriage. That's it as far as the Scripture is concerned. Anything else outside of that is not sanctioned by Scripture. And so uh, th this woman, uh, Rachel, as she was writing, uh, certainly uh, she, she understood this. And, and for people who uh, have this kind of uh, same gender attraction to hear what the Word of God has to say, that, that's like a tough pill to swallow. And, and so we understand that these issues are real. We understand that there are those struggling to reconcile their internal uh, makeup with the Word of God. And we understand that each of us every day needs the power of the Holy Spirit to help us to live the way He wants us to live. Now here's one of the really important points that Rachel makes in her article. She says, I follow Jesus Christ and obey his word because I trust him. <laughs> I never heard it put quite that way before. She does not serve the Lord because he has changed her sexual orientation and made her desire for woman go away. And she doesn't serve God because he has answered all her questions and given her a stress-free life. Here, here's what she says. In the end, this is a quote, it came down to trust. I knew Jesus was worthy of trust because he made the greater sacrifice. It's a powerful statement. I'm coming to Jesus Christ. Uh, there are issues that we have, me and Jesus, but I trust him because I know that he made the greater sacrifice. Him coming to me was the greater sacrifice. She says, the obedience of faith only works when it is rooted in a person, not a rule. She said, you know, I'm, I'm obeying him by faith. Uh, but it's not just some rule written in a book. It's because it's rooted in the person of Jesus Christ. She says, a rule flowing from relationship smooths the way for faithful obedience. And so as it is with our own parents, when they tell us things to do, there are times that we don't understand. There are times we might even be angry, but it's my mom, it's my dad. Therefore, I will do what they say because I know they love me, I know that they have my back, I know they care about me, and I, I know that I should obey because they have that right over me as my parents. So if, if you are someone else, and uh, I, I do need to let you know, what I'm talking about is not just theoretical for someone out there. There are our brothers and sisters here at Faith Sanctuary who are dealing with this uh, that, is, that is something that I have dealt with and I know to be a fact. Uh, if you are uh, struggling uh, with same gender attraction and you have questions related even to your own gender identity and things of this nature, bring yourself to God, thrust yourself in His arms, and put your trust in Him, in God we trust. Be honest with God about who you are and what it is you are facing, the struggles you are going through and the questions you have. God can handle anything you can throw at Him. He's not perturbed 
by any of that. In fact, during his time on earth, Jesus went out of his way to reach out to those that everyone else wanted to ostracize and cast out. Jesus went out of his way to be with tax collectors, to be with uh, an adulterous woman who was thrown at his feet, a Roman centurion and his slave. Jesus worked on their behalf. A demoniac who was living among the tombs, Jesus went to where he was. Lepers came and he touched lepers, people that were supposed to be away from society and unclean. So much so that Jesus was described by the religious right as being a friend of sinners and a wine-bibber, uh, which is saying, number one, he was with these people a lot, and he was eating and drinking with them. Now, when I say eating and drinking with them, you understand wine was a common uh, uh, part of meals in, in the Middle East at, at the time, and, and this was just something Jesus did. He socialized with these people. He actually enjoyed their company to the point where those looking on described him as a friend of sinners and a wine-bibber. Certainly, Jesus didn't drink and get drunk. He's God. <laughs> but, but Jesus loved and associated freely with those that so many others wanted to despise. And at the same time, Jesus never condoned sin. And this is what I'd like us to really pick up on as a people of God. Jesus loved sinners. Jesus never condoned sin. When they brought a woman to him and cast her at his feet, uh, for him to give the word for her to be stoned because of her adultery. Jesus quickly dispatched those who came. He wrote something on the ground. Nobody knows what it is. But all her accusers, when they saw what Jesus did, what Jesus wrote, they disappeared. And so Jesus looked up and said, where are your accusers? She said, they're gone. And Jesus said, well... I am not going to condemn you as these people wanted me to condemn you. You go your way, but here's the thing. Stop sinning. Go your way and sin no more. So Jesus never condoned sin. In fact, he endured every, every temptation that we have ever faced. He was tempted in all points as we are, yet without sin. And so in the same manner, we can engage the world around us with the love, compassion, and understanding of Christ. Amen? That, that is what we have the ability to do without condoning sin. Those we interact with, whoever they may be, whatever they are engaged in, should be able to speak to us and see and hear and feel that we love them, that we are not condemning them, but that we are still leading them to Christ. We need to be able to exhibit the fruit of the Spirit at all times. Thank you for that one amen. We don't need to have <laughs> two. I, I doubled my pickup. That's, that's pretty good. Uh, we don't have to have answers for every question that people have about uh, what the Bible says about this, that, and the other. We need to get answers. We certainly, in this particular aspect of dealing with, with uh, the sexual uh, uh, realities of our day, we need to familiarize ourselves with what the Bible has to say and then be able to transmit it with love, understanding, and compassion to everybody. We should never be in the place of ignoring uh, others who uh, don't live the way we do. Classmates, workmates, neighbors, the, the, there's nothing about us ignoring the reality of their lives and what they're facing. Avoiding them is not going to teach them the Word of God or bring them to Jesus Christ. This uh, lady, Rachel, I was mentioning, uh, just as a university student, started to get interested in who is this Jesus? And so, of course, as many 
people do, she just started to Google Jesus. And she came to realize that the Jesus she was reading about and meeting in Scripture wasn't the Jesus she had heard about as a child. Jesus was one who loved people. Jesus was one, as I was describing a, a couple of minutes ago, uh, uh, who, who took time to be with people others didn't want to be with. Uh, that, that was really attractive, but she knew that her life wasn't in accord with what she knew Jesus stood for. But nonetheless, she went to a, a meeting with uh, young people, a, a Christian group at her university, and what happened is that she started to see that these young people embodied the same thing that she was reading about Jesus. They, in physical flesh, were showing her love, showing her acceptance, showing her kindness that she had not expected. And if there is something that we need to know and practice as faith sanctuary, anyone who comes in the vicinity of any one of us here should feel the love of God, should feel the kindness of God, experience that, should know that God is in us so they see it in human flesh. We become the Word incarnate. We become the Word incarnate. Living epistles seen and read of all men. That is the privilege we have so that their trust in God can rise and trust we need to also trust in God that the power of his word can draw people to himself. The power of his word can change people. The power of his word can help them to understand and, and obey, even I should say obey, even when they can't understand and have faith in him because of their trust. And so we need to realize a lot of times, whatever the situation may be, Sometimes people just want someone to talk to, someone who has a compassionate listening ear that they can talk to and know that they are in a safe place. Can we be that safe place? Can we be that safe place? The more we all learn about this God-man, Jesus Christ, what he has done for us, and how he wants us to live, the more we're able to come to him in complete faith and trust. The more we know Jesus, and the more we share Jesus, the more people can see that he is worthy of our trust. We can trust him that he will help us to live the way he wants us to live. We can trust him. We can trust him. We can trust that when he comes to us, he actually comes to give us life more abundantly. Nobody's going to come and make a change to come to a life that's less than what they're leaving. No one's going to come and say, I, 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 I'm going to change everything in my whole world for something worse. Nobody does that. People need to see in us the abundant life that Jesus has promised. People need to see that although they might be in a situation that is presently not in line with the Word of God, God has the power to give them a better life. Do we believe that? God has the power to give them a more abundant life. He has the power to bring them into a love relationship with Himself that supersedes any human relationship they may have to lay aside. Do we believe that? God has the power to replace anything we lay aside that's not in conformity with his word. And he has the power to give us something immeasurably better because of his love, because of his grace, his mercy, his kindness to us, and because we can come to him in faith and complete trust. The Lord isn't here to make our lives miserable. The Lord isn't here to bring us to a place of, of, of pain and torture. Now, please understand, and we have a faith life session tonight, 
I'd like to take some time to break this down in, in a little more detail, more than uh, I feel would be good or appropriate for a Sunday morning service. That I'll, I'll be getting into this tonight. Tommy Tenney wrote a book that's called God Chasers. Some of you may have read that. It, it, it's a book that, that just from the title you understand what, what it's talking about. That we chase after God. We seek after God. We want to get in His presence. We want to get to know Him because the more we seek after Him, the more we get to know Him, the more wonderful He becomes in our lives. The closer we get to Jesus, honestly, the closer we get, the more we realize that there is nothing in life that can compare to full, complete faith and trust in Him giving ourselves to him completely, allowing his word to become our guide and just living the life he wants us to live. And so the scripture tells us, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. Four components to this scripture. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. That means I'm going to trust him and not trust what society says and not trust what politicians say and not trust what teachers say if it is opposite to what Jesus is saying, what the word of God is teaching. If I have to make a decision, I'm going to put my trust in God and his word at all times. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. This kind of trust is not a halfway, half-baked, I think I can, I think. This is a complete giving of ourselves in trust to God. Lean not on your own understanding. That's powerful. There are things we say, this is me, this is, a, I mean, this is intrinsic to who I am. This is how I think. This is how I behave. This is how I am. I am going to trust God more than I trust myself and my own understanding. I'm going to trust God more than I trust my thinking. Trust him more than I trust my feelings. Amen? Our trust in God has to be complete. All I have is trusting in you at the expense of me. That's the way we need to trust God. In all your ways, acknowledge him. God, I'm going to go your way and do what you say at all times. I'm going to acknowledge you as Lord, as master. I'm going to acknowledge you as the one who has the power to tell me how to live. The power to tell me where to go and what to do. That's how I'm going to trust you. That's how I'm going to live for you. That's how I'm going to acknowledge you. I acknowledge that you are God on the throne and I am your humble servant. In all your ways, acknowledge him. And guess what? He's going to direct every step that you take. My steps are ordered by the Lord. When I trust him, when I trust him versus trusting myself, when I acknowledge him as my Lord and my God, he will lead me and he will guide me. I will hear that still small voice that says, this is the way, walk in it. I will see the changes that he makes in me. Now let me, let me say again to finish uh, this, this particular topic that we're talking about, I'm not going to tell you that God is going to change every desire that you have in your life. In the case of this uh, lady who is writing this article, um, in fact, a young man came along knowing exactly who she was and what she was about, and he said, I want to marry you. She had absolutely no physical attraction to him, no sexual attraction to him. But because of what she read in the Word of God, she said, I am going to marry him in faith and trust that God is going to help me build a successful marriage in spite of the fact 
that this is going against my internal wiring. That's big. Now, that doesn't, that doesn't happen in most cases. It might be a situation where someone just says, I'm going to live the way the Lord wants me to live just because I trust him and his word is right. But she says, if I, as, as some married people have experienced, they see someone else out on the street and they're attracted to them, she says, I've never been attracted to a man. I'm married to a man. I have a family. I've never been attracted to a man. I still have exactly the same uh, situation dealing with that I was before I became a Christian. But I trust in God that he is going to guide my steps and lead me through. Even though I don't understand, even though it goes against who I am, I'm going to trust in God and allow him to lead me in his path. And so my question today is simply this. Uh, and I'm, I'm not, uh, this is not one of these where I want uh, people to raise hands for whatever it is they're going through. It's not just a matter of uh, sexual orientation. It's a matter of whatever it is we may be struggling with in our lives. Are you willing to put your trust in God? Say, Lord, I'm going to come and lay myself before you openly and completely. I'm not going to hide anything from you or pretend I am something that I am not. I'm going to come in prayer today and say, Lord, this is me. This is me. Uh, there's nothing we need to hide. Uh, why don't we stand together? I just want to make it easy for you to come. And I'd like anybody to come with, with uh, anything that is in your heart that you just want to lay before the Lord today and say, Lord, I'm putting my life in your hands. I trust in you. I want you to take my life and let it be consecrated to you. I want you to take my moments, my days. I want you to lead me and guide me in your will, in your way. Please, come, let's pray today. Let's trust ourselves and thrust ourselves into the hands of God his mercy, his grace, his love. Say, Lord, make me what you want me to be. Pray that prayer. Lord, make me what you want me to be. You know who I am. You know everything that I'm facing. But I'm asking you to make me what you want me to be. You could be a child of God who may have been one who has been known as being abusive, being... Uh, condemnatory and judging to the point where no one would even want to talk to you because uh, you have used the Word of God as a hammer and you need to come and say Lord I trust in you I'm going to give your word through me the ability to do its work I trust that your word will do its work and I don't need to use your word as a hammer but Lord use me as your vessel. Use me and anoint me to do your will, to do your work. Trust in God. Our trust is in him. Let's lift our voices in prayer to the Lord. I pray Stephen is with us. Anything that you've sung, you had a wonderful praise set. There are lots of those songs that you can sing again as we take this time in prayer. But let's just reach out to God in prayer right now. Trust in 